Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, we will start st studying the book of uh, Galatians, uh, the letter of St. Paul to the churches in Galatia, reveals to us the, that we are only saved by grace, nothing else. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But before we continue, let's have a word of prayer together. Father God, we all agree today as touching these things. I am praying for your utterance to speak to your people today as your own oracle, that you will make my tongue as a pen of a ready writer. Praying for the anointing of your spirit, anointing that will teach us and guide us and uh, lead us into all the truth today. Dear Spirit of God, you are the teacher. I'm just a vessel. I pray that you will open the eyes, ears, and hearts of everyone listening today, wherever they're listening from. I pray that you will show to them what you want them to get out of today's teaching. Let the light of the glorious gospel shine in our past today. Help us to separate what is God and what is not God. Father God, we thank you because Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law. Being made cause for us, for it is written that cause is any man that hangs on the tree that the blessings of Abraham may get to the Gentiles. Father, we thank you because we are saved by grace through faith and that not our own selves, but it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We always propose to be doers, not hearers only, by the power of the Holy Ghost. And in all of this, Father, I'll take no glory for all glory, honor, and power belongs to your holy name. And we give them to you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, I welcome you today again. Today we are... We're going to start studying the book of uh, Galatians. And as you know, I'm going to give you a, a, a background. The book of Galatia was written by Paul, the apostle. And um, Galatia is not a city. It's an area, a Roman province, uh, modern, modern day Turkey. So uh, Paul and Barnabas started some churches in the area of Galatia, uh, the churches of um, Antioch in Pisidia. Uh, don't confuse this Antioch in Pisidia with the Antioch in Syria. Uh, Antioch in Syria is Paul's base. That's where they were sent from, and that's where they always go back. But this is Antioch in Pisidia. And also the church in um, Iconium. Uh, Lystra and uh, Dobie. Uh, these are at least four churches that Paul started uh, in the areas of um, Galatia. And um, the book of uh, Galatia was written between 47 and uh, 55 um, uh, AD. What happened is after Paul and Barnabas planted these churches in the area of Galatia, which is modern day Turkey. Some first century legalists, uh, we call them traditionally, they were called uh, Judaizers. Judaizers are Jews. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, but they want a syncretism to it, which means they say that you are not only saved by believing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, but you have to also be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses. So these are the Judaizers. So these Judaizers infiltrated the churches at Galatia uh, with their perverted or reverse um, doctrine, which um, says that um, you are not only saved, by grace, but you gotta be circumcised, and also you gotta keep the laws of Moses. 
So when Paul heard about this, you know Paul, he took a polemic action. Uh, a polemic action is um, a strong written attack. So he wrote to the churches in Galatia, trying to separate this man, this Judaizers. These Judaizers are like parasites. They did not start their own churches. They did not plant any church. But what they were doing is after Paul had planted a church, then they were sneaking there just to pervert these churches. So this is a summary of, um, of what it's all about. And we're going to start with um, uh, verse 1 now. So Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Today we are going to cover chapter 1 and chapter 2. By God's grace, if time permits us, we will cover chapter 1 and also chapter 2. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not for men, nor true men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who were with me. So Paul now is reaffirming his apostleship. Remember that this Judaizers questioned his authority as an apostle. After all, he wasn't um, one of the 12 apostles that were with Jesus Christ. So they questioned his authority. Who is Paul to tell you that uh, you can only be saved by grace alone? Uh, and, uh, so they questioned his uh, authority as an apostle. So because of this, Paul is telling them here, he says, not for men, not true man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So he's telling them that his apostleship is not of men. Nobody um, laid hands on him to make him an apostle. And you know, sometimes we will lay hands on people and then we will uh, uh, call them one name or the other. Um, men should not be calling people into the ministry. That is wrong. God and Jesus Christ is the only one who is supposed to call someone into the ministry. Men can only ratify what God has already called. So there has to be fruit. There has to be evidence that God has called these men and women into the ministry before a man can lay hands on them just to ratify the call of God upon their lives. So Paul is here establishing that uh, I am not an apostle that was ordained by some bishop or some clergyman. But my apostleship is from the high, highest authority, Jesus Christ himself and the Father. That's what he's saying here. In verse, in verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul, as always, will give his salutation. Grace and peace. Grace, that word grace is uh, Hebrew, uh, um, um, is, is the Hebrew word, is uh, charis. That is the Hebrew word. And uh, you know, grace, people will define grace as the unmerited favor of God. And the word peace there is the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. So Paul will always combine these two words together and always in this order, grace and peace. Because until you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that uh, everything we get from God is through grace, you will not have peace. Peace will not be multiplied in your life. So Paul knows that his audience are uh, 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 the, uh, Jews and Greeks. So he will always miss this uh, greeting together because the Grecians will say, when they see somebody, they will say, uh, 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 grace. That's how they greet. 
And then the Jews, was, when they see one another, they will say, Shalom. Even present day, that's they will greet to, if you're in Jerusalem, Shalom, Shalom, which means peace. So that's what Paul, uh, he always write this way if you observe his writings. And then he says, uh, um, uh, he, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. So right now, we are in this world. But we don't belong to this world system. Jesus Christ already has delivered us from the system of the world. Once you get born again, you are called out of darkness into his own marvelous light. So we don't belong to this system anymore. But there will be a day when the rapture of the church will happen. That day he will deliver us completely out of this world. Remember the prayer Jesus Christ prayed. Father, I'm not praying that you will take them away from this world, but I'm praying that you will keep them away from the evil one. So it's the same prayer. That's what he's saying here. There will be a day Jesus Christ died for this purpose, that he will deliver us completely from this world. Right now we are out of the system of the world, but there will be a day when he will deliver us completely from that um, this uh, physical word. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of uh, Christ. So because of what these Judaizers were doing, Paul now has his uh, boxing glove on. He comes in with this uh, polemic weapon, an attack by writing. So he says, I am marveled already that you are torn, you, you have soon turned away from the grace of, of Christ to a different gospel. What is this different gospel? The gospel that uh, Paul brought to this, uh, uh, to the people of uh, Galatia is the gospel of grace. Pure grace. Grace alone. Not a mess by it. Not a mess with it. Let me explain to you what it means. It means that um, we are saved which means we become born again by believing what Jesus Christ did for us. That he died for our sins, God raised him from the dead, and we ask him to come into our life and become our Lord and Savior. As you can find this in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is the gospel Paul preached. That the salvation we have now is a free gift. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. You cannot merit it. Your good works, your personal righteousness cannot earn you this salvation. It is a pure gift of grace. Your own part is to receive it by faith. And then you become right in the presence of God Almighty. This is the gospel G, uh, Paul brought to these people. And that's why it is called good news. Good news in the sense that um, someone died in your state, in your place, to give you salvation. And all you got to do is to believe with your heart. And then you become right in the presence of God. It's good news. But as soon as something else is added to it, it departs from being good news. So the Judaizers are adding something from the gospel that Paul preached to these people. Let me tell you something. This is the reason why so many people are not saved, even in the church today. There are so many church members who are not saved. Why? Because of this simple reason here. They think that they're going to be right with God by their good works, by their personal righteousness, by their good deeds, their charitable works, their church attendance, there are regularities in prayers, the mannerism of, 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 of doing good things. 
This is what they think. This is how, what they believe. And they have been taught this way. Some of them believe as well, like these uh, syncretizers, that even though you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that you're going to add good works to it. So they say, Jesus plus good works equals to salvation. This is why so many are not saving the church today. What is the gospel that Paul preached? That it is only by faith in what Jesus Christ already did for you. This is how you're going to be, that's, this is how you're going to get your salvation. So Paul was so much angry here, upset, that the people that he already thought are already moving away from the truth. And they are going about with this other gospel, which becomes a mixture of two things. This is what he's saying here. And who are the, who are the perpetrators? The Judaizers. These ones that are moving about everywhere Paul uh, starts a church, they will sneak in there just to pervert with uh, 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 the, this, this doctrine of um, uh, uh, law and grace. Combined together. Verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven. Preach any other gospel to you. Than what we have preached to you. Let him be accursed. And, and we have said before. So now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you. Than what you have received. Let him be accursed. So this is a very strong word. The Greek word "accursed" here is uh, anatema. Anatema means like a, it means that um, let him, let that, that person be damned to hell. Let that one be condemned to hell. It's a very strong word, and the reason why Paul is using this kind of word here is he was very sure of the source of his revelation. He knew 100% that what he thought and the message he gave to these people was authentic message directly from Jesus Christ himself. So he even included himself here. He says, even if I, Paul, if I come back tomorrow or next year and I tell you that the gospel that I taught you, you now have to add something to it. He said, let himself also be accursed. Even if an angel shows up in glory and tells you that Jesus Christ is not the only way, that you've got to add something to him to get to salvation. He said, to hell with that one. That's what he says here. Very strong word. That tells you that salvation cannot be missed with any other thing but faith in what Jesus Christ did for us. Baruch Hashem Adonai, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I will not be a, a bond servant of Christ. So Paul he says here, he says, I'm not going to be that member or that man who wants to please other men just to belong. Just to say that I belong to this group, a, rest, a, a repeatable group. He says, I know the source of my revelation. I will please God because he is the source of my revelation. He says, if I dance to the tune of these Judaizers, then I will not be a born servant. Born servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, the word Lord means uh, is curious. That's the Greek word for this, curious. Curious means he to whom a person belongs to. Someone who owns. Someone who controls. That's what the word means, curious, Lord. Now, do loss means bond servant, bond slave. A bond slave is someone who has given up off, is given up his own privileges and rights 
Knowing fully that there will not be two masters in one place. If you say that you were a born servant, a born slave of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning that you are now going to give up all your privileges and rights. And now you're going to concentrate in only what the one who, who you call master says. Jesus Christ says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? But you don't do what I say. Good means your calling me law doesn't it don't show it in your practice. You are just only a hearer or a sayer, but you are not a doer. So Bible tells us that you are not you are now not your own. You have been purchased for a price. He says now glorify God in your body. And in your spirit, which are God's. You're not, you're not your own anymore. So Paul is saying here, if I deviate from this truth, then I will not be a born servant, a born slave anymore. Now I will be doing the things of my own. And I will no longer be worthy to call Jesus Christ Lord. That's the simplicity of it. In verse 11 it says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from men, nor was I taught it. But it came to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Powerful saying. So Paul is saying here that this gospel didn't come from men. I did not learn it second hand. It came directly as a revelation from Jesus Christ. And we're going to get to it. But remember when Paul got converted on his own way to Damascus, he, after three days, he was, his sight was restored. So he went into the city of Damascus to preach the gospel. But they refused him. They did not accept him. The Aksumato fan wanted to kill him. They, they, they were watching to get him so that they can kill him. So he was led over in a basket to escape. Then he went into Saudi Arabia desert. There he spent three years. Because the man knew nothing. Now he's converted. But he knew nothing. So while he was there three years we believe that he got direct revelation from Jesus Christ about this gospel of grace. Remember that gospel of grace is not by Paul. Paul is not the owner of gospel of grace. Jesus Christ is, but he taught it to Paul so that he can teach other people. So that's what happens here. And in verse um, 13, it says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous, zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So Paul is saying here, he said, I have been in the both words. He says, I was so zealous for the tradition, for the law. Remember that Paul himself was a rabbi. So he, he knew the law of Moses. He compared himself here among his peers, contemporaries. He said he was top of the class. He was so zealous. He said, I have seen that side already. But I have also seen the side of grace taught to me directly by Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Paul was trained under, if you want to know the history of Paul, at the age of 14, he was trained under Gamaliel. 
Gamaliel was a reputable rabbi who taught law. In one of his writings, Gamaliel said that um, the only problem he had with Paul was his inability to supply him with sufficient books to read. So Paul was a studio, a studious person. He was a bookworm. He was also born in Tarsus, in Sicilia region. So he was very well fam familiar with uh, Grecian culture. He grew up there. So he knew about their culture. And also he was taught in the laws of the Jews. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 5 to 6, let me read to you his own resume that he gave. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. This is Paul's resume. But now he's beginning to compare. He says, I've seen, you. I've seen the both sides. He said, I, I was. I was. I was zealous for the law. But now I've seen the reality that it's something bigger than the law, which is grace. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to travel, to, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Paul says here, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Let's stop over here. I want to give a uh, pass something to you here uh, in this uh, uh, verse. Paul says that God separated him from his mother's womb. So there are some Christians who don't believe in the doctrine of divine election and the human evolution. They don't believe. Paul is telling you here that uh, before you were born, God knew those who will be saved. And I'm going to give you scriptures just to tell you that. The divine election of God is based on his foreknowledge. Because God is omniscient, he knows everything. So he knows those who will be saved, those who will hear the gospel and believe it. He knows. So he predestinated them for eternal life. Remember in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Before Jeremiah was even formed in the womb, God knew he was going to be a prophet. He was going to receive grace. He was going to be a child of God. In Romans chapter 8 verse 29. Bible says, For whom for whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. So he knew. Through what? For knowledge. And because he knew through for knowledge, he also, he prayed this, he prayed this, he predestinated them to be formed into the, conform into the image of his son. In John chapter 15 verse 16, I believe, Jesus Christ says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. So sometimes we say, I chose the Lord. I chose the Father God. I chose to follow Jesus. You are telling you, you did not. I chose you. I chose you. You did not choose me. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, verse 48, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. 
after Paul preached, says, as many as have been appointed to a eternal life, they believed. So these ones were appointed unto eternal life. So there are so many Christians who they find it difficult to believe this doctrine of uh, divine election. That God, he knows those who will be saved. Even before they were born. Yes. But you got your own part to play in it. Because God created us as free moral agents. We got our own right to make choices. Freedom to choose. So you are the one who's going to make it complete. Because the Bible says when you have the day that you hear his voice, harden not his heart. Whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you are the one who will make that move to bring it into completeness. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, the Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And in, e in Ephesians, the Bible says we are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. So, don't say, okay, I don't know if I, I'm chosen or not. No, you'll be, you'll be making mistakes. When you hear his voice, you are the one who will bring this into completeness. But God, because of his foreknowledge, he knew those who will answer the call. And before the creation of the foundation of the earth, he knew this once already. Let's continue with our studies today. And uh, so Paul says, he says, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. That's what I said earlier. So when Paul had about, uh, when Paul had his conversion in the, on his way to Damascus, um, he, he did not confirm with flesh and blood. He went to Saudi Arabia with that where he got his own uh, revelation. Even when he returned back to Jerusalem from Damascus, when they refused him there, he went to Jerusalem. Even at that point, he did not hang out with the apostles. He only met with Peter uh, and, uh, and also James, the brother of Jesus. So for like two weeks. So whatever Paul knew, the revelation he got, he did not get from the apostles. It was first hand given to him by Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's what he's saying here. Now, in verse, in verse 18, he says, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remain with him for 15 days. About 15 days, he remained with uh, Peter. That's when he, when he went from Damascus uh, back to uh, uh, Jerusalem. After spending those three years in uh, Saudi Arabia. But I saw none of the apostles except James, the lost brother. Now, concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. He is still bold. He is still standing firm with his own revelation that this is from God, not of man. Afterwards, I went into the region of Syria and Sicilia and Cilicia, and I was unknown by faith to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But there we are hearing only he who form, formerly persecuted us now preached the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. So after in Jerusalem, they rejected Paul as well because the apostles didn't believe he was true, truly an apostle. So it was Barnabas who took Paul and introduced him to the apostles and said, hey, this man is a genuine apostle. I even was with him in Damascus. But even at that, they did not receive Paul. So Paul went back to his hometown, Tarsus, in uh, Cilicia. There he was about for seven years. So you see, it took Paul a while before his ministry started. At least ten years. 
Even though Jesus Christ told him he is a chosen vessel, that he was going to stand in the, he was going to be witness for him among the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. But it took 10 years of preparation before Paul was actually in the ministry full time. There are people when they come into the ministry, when they get born again, they want to start right away. They want to have their own ministry right away. They want to be uh, pastor churches, 500, 1,000 people right away without preparation. For we don't put novice in the place of a uh, deacon. Otherwise, they'll be puffed off in pride. They're not matured. And the enemy will take advantage of their position because they are not prepared. So there are people, they want it to happen right away. But there is a time of preparation. Bible says, despise not the day of small beginning. Even though your beginning was small, but your later end will greatly increase. Even though in your own business, in your own uh, specialty, do not be in a rush. Always know there is a time for preparation. Any business that is built with that kind of uh, speed, Without preparation, it doesn't last long. It's just a matter of time. It will crumble and it will crash. So you can see Paul, he has spent 10 years before he was able to go to his own, to his, uh, the first missionary journey with a Barnabas. A good lesson to be learned. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. We are now going to get into chapter 2. We finish chapter 1. In chapter 2. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Tyros with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, least by any means I might run, and had run in vain. Yet not even Tyrus was, who was with me, being a Greek, was compared to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by shield to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So Paul is saying here, after 14 years, he went into Jerusalem. He went back to Jerusalem from, Ant I believe now, the, from Antioch. So they went to Jerusalem. Antioch in Syria is like a base. Remember that uh, Paul. Uh, um, when I told him he went back to Tarsus after he was rejected in Jerusalem he went back to Tarsus his own town and the church of Christ began to spread and grow in Antioch Barnabas which, is, which means son of consolation that's what it means realized that Paul would be of a great use because of the church growth in Antioch so he went to Tarsus and found Paul and he brought him to Antioch. And they were there ministering, ministering until the point when the Holy Spirit says, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the mission which I have called them. So from Antioch here, they went to uh, uh, Jerusalem to visit with the brothers, the apostles there. And he took with him Titus. So they told, they communicated with the apostles there, the progress of the gospel of grace. Even those who were there, I believe the Judaizers, wanted Titus to be circumcised because he was, a, he was a Greek. But Paul stood firm because he knew. Titus here is an evidence that uh, you don't become a good person because of the law. You don't get saved by law. He said, for him, he says, look at the life of Tyros. He is a changed man, but he's not circumcised. And uh, they, they could not compel Tyros to be circumcised because Paul was there standing bold 
on the gospel of grace. In verse 6, he says, But from those who seem to be something, <laughs> he's talking about those who seem to be something, <laughs> Paul. Wherever they were, it makes no difference. Whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. To those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of circumcision had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, the gospel of uncircumcision had been committed to me as the gospel of the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and there to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. So he says here, but those who, were, who, who seem to be something. So he's talking about here, those who seem to be something. Talking about the apostles. In the eyes of the Judaizers. To, to the Judaizers, these are the real apostles. Those who were with Jesus Christ when he was on the earth. So they seem to be something. But Paul says this was didn't make any change in my life. They did not add anything to the gospel of grace which I received to me. So they did not profit me anything. And um, when the apostles, when they noticed this true gospel of grace that Paul and Barnabas preached, when they noticed that it was genuine and authentic. They gave them the right hand of fellowship. They said, okay, now you go. Go to the Gentiles, the ones that are not circumcised, so that Peter will focus on the ones that are circumcised. And, uh, and, and, and then they urged them, advised them not to forsake their poor. And you can see that Paul uh, collected uh, uh, gifts from Gentile churches to help the saints at Jerusalem. One, what we, 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 we there is a lesson we got to learn from here. Always know where you are called, because that's where you're going to find your grace for success. You see what happened here when the apostles. When they come to the recognition that Paul and Barnabas have been called to the uncircumcised, they gave them the right hand of fellowship. They supported them. They say, go. That's where your grace is. Go. Concentrate on the uncircumcised. That's what you have been called to do. That's where you're going to find grace and empowerment. That is why you're going to find accomplishment and progress and victory. There are people in the ministry, those who have been called to be teachers and pastors, but they've left the area they were called, and now they are in different areas. They want to be evangelists. They want to go into healing ministry. Deviating from the place of their calling. The place where you are called is a place where you're going to find grace. Very important. Because when God calls you, he's going to equip you for the purpose. He's going to equip you for that place that he called you. Even in your own personal lives, in our own personal lives, is a very big lesson to learn. Find that from God. By his spirit that is in you. What he has called you to do. 
he will reveal it to you. There are people who are called in different fields, and they are all in a different in other fields. Someone called to be a medical doctor, but he's going to, to be a pilot. And in that field, they will have so many struggles. If you are struggling so much in the area, in the area of your specialization, chances are high that you are not called to be in that area. Because there won't be any grace for you to accomplish it. Each and every one of us, there is something God has called us to do. What you're going to do is to find out what that thing is. And God will reveal it to you. One step at a time through his Holy Spirit that is in you. So if you are spending time in an area where you are not called, or there is so much struggle in your ministry or in your area of specialization, look within and find out, is it the place that I am called to flourish? Or am I in this place because this is what I want to do? This is what I like to do. Are you hearing me, friends? Very important thing to consider. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away in the hypocrisy. So, what he's saying here is, uh, Peter visited Antioch where Paul and Barnabas were and the Gentiles. So I believe he's talking about what they call agape feast or love feast. Um, it's, it, it will be like a, 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 a potluck dinner today. So this is where believers will gather together and um, everybody will bring, they do it once a week. Everybody will cook something from the house and they will bring, so they will share together. At the end, they will finish it up with the communion. And this is very beneficial to the poor and those who were slaves of those days. Because this will be the best meal they probably had the whole week. So when, when Peter visited, he was eating with these Gentiles. But as soon as some men... I believe some Judaizers again showed up from Jerusalem from James. <laughs> so as soon as Paul saw them, he withdrew himself from eating with the Gentiles. Because he was afraid, we were scared of what they're going to say. Perhaps they're going to go back to Jerusalem and tell the apostles what he was doing in Antioch. So Paul said he withdrew him to his face. So, Paul told him that I, you, you are sending mixed messages. It was you, Peter, who went to the house of Cornelius in Caesarea. You went in the house of a Gentile. You were not supposed to go in there. Yourself, you lived like a Gentile. But why are you separating yourself here, sending mixed messages? So even the mess, even even what Peter did here, corrupted other people who were with him. Even Barnabas followed their footsteps. So Paul was so upset about it. You could not send mixed messages. You, do, you no longer you don't belong to the law. You are now living by grace. You don't wake up one morning and say, "Now I'm going to syncretize. I'm going to mix up grace and works." And then the next day, 
I'm going to go just by sound grace. You don't mix it up. That's what Paul is saying here. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? The same thing I just said. So the mixed message is, if you, Peter, you live in like the Gentiles, you don't follow those laws anymore. You don't keep the laws of Moses anymore. You are living now by grace. Why do you want these Gentiles now? To give to them a burden that they cannot carry. The Pharisees, Jesus Christ was talking about the Pharisees. He said they will bind, they will bind the heavy load on your shoulder. They want you to carry it, but them themselves cannot lift a finger. So if these things, remember, when Paul, the Saint Peter, Saint Peter here. In Jerusalem, when Paul and Barnabas went back there, because of certain Judaizers came to Antioch and said that believers also must be circumcised and follow the laws of Moses. They went back to get what the apostles will say about it. It was Peter himself who said that why would we, why do we want to compel these uh, Gentiles to keep the laws of uh, Moses? which ourselves and our fathers were not able to bear. The same Peter here is separating himself from the Gentiles. So this is why Paul was upset about it. Verse 15. When we, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Paul is talking the reality here that we are not justified anymore by the law. The law was only like a schoolmaster just to lead us to Christ. And after you are led to Christ, you are no longer under the law. You are no longer justified under the law. The only justification in the presence of God Almighty is your faith in what Jesus Christ did. That is why when God looks at you, he sees you in Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying that we are no longer justified by the works of the flesh. With the works of the flesh, no man will see God. But now we are justified only by what Jesus Christ did for us at the cross. All we got to do now is to believe. He died for my sins. God raised him from the dead. He is now my Lord and Savior. You ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and your Savior. And right away, you are recreated and you become a new creature. The righteous one shall live by faith. It's no longer by your works or by your actions or your marriage. Because it's not possible. You could not. By works of the law, you could not earn a place in the sight of God. It's impossible. That's why Jesus Christ came and he died for the sins of all mankind. That whosoever believes should not perish, but have eternal life. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are from sinners. Christ, therefore, a minister of sin, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I do it again those things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For I know the Lord died. 
to the Lord that I might live to, for, for God. For I know the Lord died to the Lord that I might live for God. So what he's saying here, he says, if I should go back again to those things which I once believed before I found Christ, if I should go back again to righteousness by works, I will be in transgression. I will not be right with God. So now that I have found the truth, that salvation is by faith and faith alone, not an added to it. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Then I have no reason again to go back to those things which I have left behind when I found the revelation that they just shall live by faith. That's what he's saying here. And therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight. By the deeds of the law, in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, no flesh shall be justified. In verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the, by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Paul is saying now that uh, we, we have been crucified with Christ. When Christ died, we died with him. When he was raised from the dead, we were raised with him together. Everything that Jesus Christ did for us before we were under the law, before we were people who followed the laws of Moses. But it's telling us now that the purpose why Jesus Christ came was to put to death, to crucify all of these uh, traditions and all these requirements of the law. He says that is the purpose. And because I died with him, the requirement to keep every one of those things died. Now the life that I live now, I live it by the faith of the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. Faith in what he did for me. Faith in the grace that he has given to me. Faith in salvation by faith alone. This is where my faith is right now. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God. Because if I go back again, keeping all these traditions and the laws, meaning that the grace of God is in vain. Because by grace we are saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. So we cannot go back to the law. If we do that, means that the grace of God is no longer effective. It's no longer working. It becomes something that is in vain for us. That's what he's saying here. And he says, for if righteousness come to the law, then Christ died in vain. Remember when Jesus Christ was at the garden of Gethsemane? He prayed, Father. He said, if it's possible, take this cup from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now, his prayer was not answered. Because there was no other way possible for that to be accomplished except the only way that Jesus Christ had to go. Through his death and resurrection. If there was any other way that the human beings could be saved, God would have answered the prayer of Jesus. And then Jesus would not have gone to the cross. But because Jesus went to the cross simply means that there is no other way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one come to the Father but by me, only. No other name under heaven whereby we must be saved by the name of Jesus. And except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So there is no other way. If through the righteousness of man, human righteousness, that man could be saved, then Jesus would, have, Jesus would not have gone to the cross. But there was no other way. So that's why he's saying us here. In Romans chapter 11 verse 16. The Bible says. And if by grace. Then it's no longer of works. Otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works. It is no longer grace. Otherwise work is no longer work. So it is only by grace, friends, understand it today, that your access to the Father Almighty, your way to the kingdom of God, is not by what you do. It's not by your personal effort, your merits, your good works. This is the same reason why so many in the church are not born again. It is only by grace alone, by believing with what Jesus Christ says, what Jesus Christ did for you. Remember the law will tell you, do this and you will live. But grace will tell you, believe this and you will live. What a wonderful uh, uh, comparison. Remember that the grace of God is complete by itself. You cannot add to it. You cannot remove anything from it. You cannot grow in grace. But once you are saved and you are born again, now your recreated, your recreated spirit will give you the capacity, the ability, enablement to now live a better life. So it becomes a fruit. So you going to church every Sunday becomes a fruit. Of righteousness. You doing charitable work. Becomes a fruit. Of righteousness. You giving arms. Helping people out. All those good things now. Will become fruit. Of your salvation. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends. I've come to the end of today's teaching. We were able to cover. Galatians chapter 1 and 2, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're listening to me now and you're not yet born again, you are not yet born again, you're not a Christian, now is your opportunity. A golden one for that matter. You, can, you could be a member of a church, but you don't understand what salvation is all about. You don't know what it means to be born again. For you, you think that... Uh, if I'm a member of a church and I'm baptized in water, then I'm right in the presence of God. But no, that's not what it means. You can be born, you can, you can be baptized in water, you can be a member of a church and die and still go to hell. Yes. So what is it then to be born again? To be born again means that you Put aside your good works, your self-righteousness, your good deeds, your behaviors. And then you come to Jesus, depending only on him, what he did for you. You believe with your heart that he is the son of God. He died for your sins, 
God raised him from the dead on the third day. And then you ask him now for to come into your life and be your Lord and your Savior. You begin a personal relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. So if you haven't done this, now is an opportunity because there is no other way you can do this. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. No other name under heaven whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So even if you belong to any other religion and you're hearing this message now, know it that religion will not save you. Don't say that we call upon the same God. We don't. Why? Because the Bible says, he that rejects the Son rejects the Father also. So until you have Jesus Christ, you cannot have access to the Father. That's what the Bible says. So what must you do? Jesus says, come as you are. That's what the Bible teaches. Come as you are. Do not say, let me go and get my acts together. You could not. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not even one. So you come as you are. And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he will not keep you the same way you came to him. He will change you. Your spirit will be recreated. You have eternal life in you. And you will begin to see changes and progress in your life. Friends, there is a place called hell. I'm going to warn you about it. It is my duty to preach to you the gospel to tell you about Jesus Christ. It is your own duty to receive him or to live it. Why? Because we are free moral agents. We have our own right to choose. There is a place called hell, a real place, where those who reject Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior will spend eternity. A place burning with fire and brimstone. You don't want to go there. It's a place of torture and darkness. But you are the one who's going to make a choice while you are alive, whether you go there or not. If you choose Jesus today, you have no business with hell. But if you reject him, I am sorry to let you know that will be a place where you will spend eternity. The day you hear his voice, had not your heart. For behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him. He will also eat with me. Jesus is making it, is leaving it up to you to make that choice. Receive him today as your Lord and your Savior. And you will have eternal life. Our time here on the earth is very short. Time is very limited. If you live too long, you're going to live 120 years. But after that, what happens? People die every day. About 155,000 people will die today somewhere in the world. Where will they spend eternity? Where do they go? It all depends. The choice is for you to make. Jesus says, if you believe that I'm not he, you will die in your sin. If you believe that I'm not the Messiah, the Savior of the world, says you will die in your sin. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. But he that believes not shall not have, see life. But the wrath of God abides in him. You don't want to face the wrath of God, friends. It is real. So that is why you will have to make that decision today. David says there is only but one step between me and death. You don't know when it's going to happen. But let that be one step between you and uh, heaven. Let that step be Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That you receive him today as your Lord and your Savior. I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer, friends. If you pray this prayer with all your heart, you mean it. You're going to be born again right now. Right now. No delays. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he is your son. He died for my sins. You raised him up from the dead on the third day. 
Jesus Christ, I ask you this day to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I am now born again. That I am a child of God. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I have now eternal life. Father God, I thank you for this. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, if you pray that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Now, that is a subsequent experience. We call it the infilling of the Holy Spirit or empowerment by the Spirit of God. It's subsequent after your salvation. It is evident by speaking with other tongues. If you go to my archive on YouTube, Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian, find a teaching there called Speaking in Tongues is for Every Believer. It will help you and teach you what you need to know about this experience. Now you were a baby Christian because you just got born again. So it is very, very splendid for us that you find a good church where they teach the word of God and become a member of that church. Buy Bible and read, your, read the word of God. That's how you're going to grow. Faith will come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Peter says, desire the sincere make of the word of God that you may grow by. I want to use this opportunity to thank all our partners all over the world. Those that are praying for this ministry. Those that are helping us financially to reach other people with their financial gifts at no cost to them. If you want to be a partner to this ministry, please go to www.kuim.org. That's our website. And there will be a donation button there where you can securely give your gifts. Friends, remember, it is only those who hear the word of God. And they do. We call them doers of the word of God. They are the ones who get the full benefits of the word of God. Surely there is an end. And your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. La granda machine de libro couvre escatama engrendeski ingre uparatia.